Hello, Johnny Red here. I'm going to have to do a video about free speech, it looks like. The social media giants, Google, which includes YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, have, since their rise to prominence, considered themselves to be pro-free speech. An open marketplace of ideas, they called themselves. A true free speech platform would, of course, have to obey civil and criminal laws. Physical threats, slander, incitement to violence, these things should not be permitted online, even as they are not permitted in real life. By law, at least here in the U.S., all other speech is okay. The big social media companies still have such phrases in their vision statements. When you read their terms of service, however, there are quite a few buts in there. For example, YouTube's community guidelines say, Our products are platforms for free expression, but... We don't support content that promotes or condones violence against individuals or groups based on race or ethnic origin, religion, disability, gender, age, nationality, veteran status, or sexual orientation, gender identity, or whose primary purpose is inciting hatred on the basis of those characteristics. There is a fine line between what is and is not considered to be hate speech. For example, it is generally okay to criticize a nation-state, but if the primary purpose of the content is to incite hatred against a group of people solely based on their ethnicity, or if the content promotes violence based on any of these core attributes, like religion, it violates our policy. The problem I have with this is, is that to enforce these hate speech prohibitions, you have to be able to read the minds of the person being accused to know what his primary purpose, that is, his intention, was. All right, so promoting violence, I can understand. That should be banned. YouTube tries to squelch content that does this. But inciting hatred? What does that mean? Let's take an example from real life. Antifa and the Proud Boys. There's a lot of hatred between them. They threaten each other. They insult each other. There have been assaults. The name-calling and the insults are free speech protected under the First Amendment. Threats, however, are not. If I call you a stupid scumbag, or worse, and you physically attack me, am I responsible for inciting violence? I say no. Sometimes certain facts are offensive to individuals or groups, races, nations, religions, ethnicities. Millennial Woes was recently banned from Twitter for this tweet, quote, Black men are more prone to committing violent crime than white men. Now this is a verifiable fact. It's in the FBI crime statistics. You can look up the numbers. Perhaps his primary purpose was to warn others of potential threats to their physical persons. Or to warn white people not to go into black neighborhoods where they might be victims of assault. You see the problem? How does YouTube know what our primary purpose in posting certain content is? If content does in fact incite hatred, is the content producer at fault? Or are those who take offense simply by being overly sensitive at fault? Or are they trying to prevent their own political viewpoints from being undermined? YouTube's guidelines also suggest, keep in mind that not everything that's mean or insulting is hate speech. If you're upset by content that a specific person is posting, you may wish to consider blocking that person. If, however, you feel that the content violates our hate speech policy, report it to YouTube for review in one of the following ways. And it says you can flag the video or file an abuse report. Twitter's rules regarding hateful conduct say you may not promote violence against, threaten, or harass other people on the basis of race, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, religious affiliation, age, disability, or serious disease. The only word in there that's vague and fuzzy is harass. If I say something and someone feels harassed by it, am I guilty then of harassment? I say no. There needs to be a specific set of behaviors that constitute harassment. These need to be defined. Anita Sarkeesian considered herself to be harassed by people on the internet who said that she sucks. They called her names. Is that harassment? Is it harassment if done by a large enough number of people? If someone has 200,000 subscribers or followers and they call out someone on their 
in their opinion, bad behavior, and half of their followers go over to that person's site and call them names and criticize them, is that harassment? Is that cyberbullying? Is the creator whose followers criticize someone en masse guilty of what their followers do, even if he or she didn't actually call for them to do so? If so, then probably over 50% of all political conversations on all social media would have to be banned. YouTube's harassment and cyberbullying clause in their guidelines says, It's not okay to post abusive videos and comments on YouTube. If harassment crosses the line into a malicious attack, it can be reported and may be removed. In other cases, users may be mildly annoying or petty and should just be ignored. Again, the words abusive and malicious are vague and subjective, which opens the door to selective biased enforcement. In a leaked Google internal company briefing, they argue that Google, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter are caught between two incompatible positions. The unmediated marketplace of ideas versus the well-ordered spaces of safety and civility. So Google here is saying that the American tradition prioritizes free speech over democracy, not civility. And that the European tradition favors dignity over liberty and civility over freedom. And that social media has been moving towards civility that is, away from free speech. Note the false dichotomy. You have, according to them, the choice between democracy or civility, or between dignity and civility, or liberty and freedom. For over 150 years, this country has had democracy and civility, dignity and freedom. Now it's either or. See how they're building the case for censorship? Google cites users behaving badly as the reason that the early utopian period of the internet has collapsed under the weight of bad behavior. Behaving badly, wow, that's certainly a specific criterion for censorship. I could say that Google is behaving badly by censoring my content. Of course, only certain kinds of bad behavior are enumerated in the briefing. I'll only list examples that are vague and open to multiple interpretations. One is hate speech. Although people have long been racist, sexist, and hateful in many other ways, they weren't empowered by the Internet to recklessly express their views with abandon. From film stars to activists, viciousness is aimed at a diverse range of user. Trolling By provoking arguments and flaming disruption, trolls threaten valuable debate, debate and infuriate users. The problem has become so rampant that several websites have even resorted to removing comments entirely. Cyber harassment. From petty name calling to more threatening behavior, harassment is an unwelcome component of life online for all too many users. With sustained stalking and one-off incidents defining the spectrum, some experiences are easier to escape than others. Cyber racism. Supremacy, destiny, and nationalism, otherness, separation, and hostility. Cyber racism exists in many guises, but it most often describes a range of white supremacist movements in Europe and North America and the new horizons the Internet and digital media have opened for them. Nationalism, white supremacy, really. So what if a person thinks his nation, race, or religion is the best? Is that what is meant by supremacy? Should all such expressions be banned? Note that racism is mentioned under hate speech and it also has its own category, cyber racism. This reflects the role of the ADL and the SPLC in formulating these examples of, quote, bad behavior. ADL and the University of California at Berkeley's D-Lab have been working to develop a new approach to tackle online hate using the latest methods. The goal of the Online Hate Index is to help tech platforms better understand the growing amount of hate on social media and to use that information to address the problem. By combining artificial intelligence and machine learning with social science, the Online Hate Index will ultimately uncover and identify trends and patterns in hate speech across different platforms. 
We've just completed our first phase of research, and we found that the machine learning model identified hate speech accurately between 78 and 85 percent of the time. Black nationalism, Muslim misogyny, violent lyrics in hip-hop music, and cyber stalking by leftist groups against conservatives or right-wing groups are not mentioned. Another way Google censors is by promoting, quote, authoritative sources to the top of search lists. On page 45 of the briefing, we find, quote, untrustworthy sources and misinformation have thrived on tech platforms. Dubious distributors have capitalized on a lack of sense checking and algorithms that reward sensationalist content. And rational debate is damaged when authoritative voices and have a go commentators receive equal weighting. There are a lot of problems here. First of all, who decides who is trustworthy? From my experience, most major media outlets are not trustworthy, while independent journalists and creators have less bias. That used to be the great thing about YouTube. Anyone could be published far and wide, and his or her ideas could sink or rise based on the quality of the content. Apparently, the moguls at Google don't think that the average person is smart enough to distinguish between the real and the fake. According to them, that's why they elected Trump. They are trying to remedy that situation now by burying independent have-a-go creators beneath pages and pages of so-called authoritative sources. I am genuinely concerned that we might be losing our right to express our opinions in the public square of the Internet. Many, especially on the right side of the political spectrum, but some on the extreme left also, have already lost that right. This clip from Tucker Carlson on Big Tech Tyranny explains the situation, I think, uh, very clearly. In the past few days, Apple, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, and other companies have all banned Alex Jones from using their platforms. Also, Twitter purged various libertarian accounts. Instagram temporarily banned Tommy Robinson. Facebook took down a GOP candidate's ads for allegedly being offensive. And a Democratic Senator Chris Murphy says mass censorship is needed to ensure, quote, the survival of the democracy, end quote. Well, Twitter has long denied that it is biased against conservative accounts. That's obviously a lie. It's always obviously been a lie, and now it is a proven lie. A new report by Vice found that Republican lawmakers on the conservative accounts wouldn't show up in the search bar when users searched for them. That is censorship, obviously, and it was intentional. Congressman Matt Gates of Florida was one of those conservatives shadow banned by Twitter. He has filed a complaint against the company with the Federal Election Commission. Congressman Gates joins us tonight. Congressman, thank you for coming on. So I, I guess you, the Tucker. first is a factual question. You're certain that this happened to you and it was intentional? Well, I'm certain that there were only four members of Congress who had their voices suppressed on Twitter. Matt Gates, Jim Jordan, Mark Meadows, and Devin Nunes. So that'd be one hell of a coincidence. My suspicion is that if people were effectively communicating a conservative message, they got caught in tr Twitter's troll trap. The reason that I think that that is illegal is because that it gives advantages to our political opponents. It gives them access to the platform that we don't have. If Twitter was a billboard company and they gave Democrats access to their billboards and not Republicans, that would be an illegal corporate donation to the campaigns of Democrats. Here, instead of the billboard, it's the auto fill in function as a part of Twitter's search feature that wasn't available to me, Devin Nunes, Mark Meadows, or Jim Jordan, and it's available to Democrats. We generally don't trust governments to make decisions about the kinds of opinions that ought to be aired or, or what tr things are false and what things are true. Why would we possibly trust Silicon Valley executives who have even less accountability and less transparency, um, no democratic accountability, in fact, to make those decisions on these platforms that have, for better or worse, become our public squares? I think it's incredibly uh, dangerous. And if we think that it's only going to be used in ways that we like, just look at the history of censorship. That's never how it works. You believe that the FEC can remedy this? They absolutely can institute fines, just like they could institute fines and punishment against any company that illegally makes a corporate donation to a political campaign. Here, the corporate donation is allowing Democrats and the people running against me specifically to have access to elements of the search feature that I didn't have access to. And why, Tucker? Why? 
Twitter has said in their official response that it was my behavior that resulted in this. I don't know what behavior that is. So are we really going to trust tech companies to be able to just decide with no transparency what behavior limits someone's ability to amplify their message? That sounds like the tech tyranny series you did a couple months ago is coming to life before our very eyes. Well, it clearly is. And Twitter is a fairly small player in this world. It's a failing company anyway. Google dominates all of tech. And in, in fact, it's the portal through which almost all human information flows. So if Google were to hold things back in search or put its thumb on the scale in any way, they could have a huge effect on our society. Congress exists to make sure that the public interest is represented. And yet I've never heard a member of Congress say, we're going to get to the bottom of this. We're going to break up Google. We're going to fulfill our oversight role here. Why not? Well, frankly, too many members of Congress just don't understand the gravity of the issue. But now we're the ones that have the targets drawn on our foreheads. And so I think that you'll see more engagement from the Congress coming forward. A reasonable libertarian might ask, why shouldn't I just leave Twitter? Why should I you know, have excessive government regulation? And it's important to recognize Twitter and other social media companies use the federal government to get rid of lawsuits that they don't want to have to defend against. And they use a provision that, that requires them to hold themselves out as a neutral public forum. So Twitter and Facebook can't say on one hand, we're neutral and thus we shouldn't have to respond to lawsuits. And then on the other hand, tell me and other outspoken conservatives that our behavior results in suppression on their That's platform. Right. They can't have it both ways. Mark Zuckerberg has always claimed that Facebook was a platform for all ideas. Fine. You know, in doing that, he says, I'm not a publisher. I'm just a means of people putting out their messages. You know, whether you, whatever you think of Alex Jones and InfoWars, and you, you know, you may say, hey, this guy's a bit out there. There. The point is, he's got a big following, he has an opinion, and if you believe in free speech, if you believe in your First Amendment rights, people should be allowed to do this. I would say that by banning Jones, by shadow banning many others, Facebook and others are now effectively becoming a publisher, and that means, because they're taking editorial decisions, they should be open to being sued as other media organizations are. For conservatives in general, there's this dogma that says that government has no business telling private companies what they can and can't do, what ideas they have to associate themselves with. We just right. had a big debate over, for example, whether a bakery can be forced to make a cake uh, in commemoration of a ceremony that the owners of that business find personally offensive for religious reasons. But the only exception to that, I think, on, on, on sort of by consensus, is when some, a company becomes more than just a company, they have monopolistic power. Um, and in the case of companies like Google and Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg said a few years ago, we're basically like a government. We make our own laws um, that govern our community. Two billion people use Facebook. And when you look at what these companies control, it's not just widgets, right? It's data about us and the flow of news and information and debate to vest companies with this kind of power that's essentially limitless with limitless control to do whatever they want, to do it in secret, to have secret algorithms that control what we see and what we don't see is a serious menace to our democracy. And I think whether you're a free market conservative or kind of a leftist or a liberal, nobody should like companies like this having monopolistic power greater than the governments of nation states, which is what they have. Let me suggest, though, that some of the argument by Twitter and what they're doing is they're saying that these comments violate their standards. And if we open it up to, let's say, lawsuits for libel, wouldn't it make it even more difficult to have speech? Wouldn't more people be banned? Wouldn't there be more people suspended? No, because if you're a platform for all ideas, you are not a publisher. That is the point. And what Zuckerberg and the other tech giants are trying to do is they're now trying to have it both ways. On the one hand, they claim, you know, we're not publishers, we're not open to libel because we let everybody uh, give their opinion. But on the other, they now, in a very sinister way, are starting to ban and shadow ban. What these uh, social media platforms have done is they have absolutely, with their digital advertising, sucked the life out of traditional journalism so that, you know, the, the traditional journalism outlets are on their last legs. They're, they're teetering into extinction. And there are the places where they actually can get sued. If they do defamation, if they publish libel, they can be held libel, but these uh, other platforms cannot. Hmm. So between their market power, which I think is something that the DOJ should look at with antitrust regulation and with their, frankly, false advertising to being uh, open to everybody, which Twitter promises, Facebook promises, and, uh, you know, YouTube to a certain degree promises, although they don't pretend to do that anymore. 
I think that wraps it up for this video, but I encourage you to continue to explore this topic. And below are a few links I've found helpful, including a link to sign a petition for an Internet Bill of Rights that goes to whitehouse.gov. It already has over 126,000 signatures. The goal was 100,000, so add yours to it. Who knows, maybe it'll help. Thanks for listening. Till next time, keep on thinking free.